Hey, Lab Code Agents, it's Tristan, and today we've got Amanda with us. She's one of our amazing admins, and she also happens to be an amazing real estate agent, too. So she, today she's going to tell us her story of how she started and her whole journey up to where she is now. And I think it'll help us and motivate us and just, just guide us, because a lot of the times we need a good example. and and she is a great example. Um, so listen in. We'll be here for an hour. And Amanda, I look up to you. So oh, well, I look up to you. So. Yeah, so there you go. That's why we like each other. <laughs> I love it. So Amanda, tell us a little bit about yourself so that people that don't know you can kind of get a, a gist of who you are. Okay. Well, my name is Amanda Todd. I'm in the Sacramento area in California. And I just had my three year anniversary of being a producing real estate agent. Yay. Um, it's on Cinco de Mayo, so it's always easy to remember. And hey, who doesn't want <laughs> a party on Cinco de Mayo? Um, so anyways, I am a single mom with three kids and they are my world. And I, got into real estate because I'd been a stay at home mom for nine and a half years. And it was time now that I had to support my kids. I all of a sudden became a single mom and it was, it was rough. It was really rough. It was really scary. I came out of a really horrible situation and just said, you know what? I want to teach my kids how to have the best life that they possibly can. And I wanted a good life for myself too. I got married really young. I got married when I was 18 and I had my oldest when I was 21. And so I grew up being a wife and a mom. And Wait, so then now, you had your oldest when you were 21. Yeah. And I had I my baby. That. I didn't know that about you. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of fun. I'm a young mom. I have Oh my gosh, I'm soon to have a seventh grader, a fifth grader, and a third grader. And I'm only oh, 30. Oh, that's insane. That's on top of, oh wow, that's great. Yeah, it's it's fun. We have a great time. So it's fun because I get to be the young, exciting, fun mom, but I'm a really strict mom too. So I'm a big believer in you can't always be their best friend, but that's a different story. We can get into that later. Um, my bachelor's degree is in child development and and I'm three classes shy of having a degree in chemistry as well. I was going Ooh. to go to Nova. Wow. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy. I have a very diverse educational background. Um, my original major was in exercise science, actually, which plays into my sanity now, which I'll talk about in a second. But anyway, so I got into real estate because okay. I was now a single mom. And I had only lived in the area that I live in for 18 months. I don't have family in real estate. I only had had my own my own transactional experience just from buying and selling my own houses. In my former life, I was an Air Force wife. So I moved around quite a bit and bought and sold homes around the country and had a personal taste for the process. And so I got into real estate and just said, you know what? My only option is to do really well at this. I had a mentality that success was my only option. I didn't even want to say failure was an option because I didn't even want failure as a word programmed in my brain. Success was my only option. And so I jumped in and started into real estate. I had $300 a month that I could spend on online leads. Wow. And so purchasing Zillow leads. And then I made it a point that I wanted to be the neighborhood specialist in my neighborhood. I live in a great neighborhood that um, at the time, it ranged from probably 300,000 up to about 1.2 million. Now I would say you can't get into our neighborhood for anything under 400,000 and they go up. I mean, there's some custom homes that are really amazing up in a country club portion of our neighborhood. So I felt like I wanted to make myself the neighborhood expert. And so I jumped in and I made it a point to go to every open house in my neighborhood so I could learn the floor plans. I made it a point, I started making a neighborhood newsletter and I started passing out my neighborhood newsletter with my kids. I'd take my kids with me. We'd go for walks. We'd go knock on people's door. If they weren't there, we'd leave them the neighborhood newsletter. If they were, then I'd introduce myself to them. And I didn't... So, go ahead. Month one, this is month one when you got yeah. your real estate license. You had uh, 300... License when I became a single mom. <laughs> I was in a situation where um, I was told I couldn't work 
And so then once I got out of that really horrible situation, that was when I really started working in real estate. Got it. So once you got out, you had $300 to spend a month or yep. total. What was it? Yep. Um, I spent, I, well, I spent $300 a month on Zillow and then I spent probably $150 on printing this neighborhood newsletter. Okay. And did you even care that there may have been other established agents in the neighborhood or that didn't even bother you? I have so many agents that live around me. And so when people say, oh, it's the neighborhood so saturated with real estate agents, that to me is just an excuse. You, you know what? That's, that's beautiful because it's, it's a mindset, right? It is. It is. It's totally a mindset. People Everyone knows an agent. I, know, I mean, you and I know agents, of course, but everybody else. I mean, I could think of it. I lived like around the corner from probably four different agents, but nobody was doing what I was doing. So then I decided I also wanted to have a community event. Again, we live in an awesome neighborhood, but there's no HOA. So because of that, there's no community events because there's no HOA to hold them. So I decided, hey, it's awesome that I don't pay HOA fees, but I'd really like to have a community event. So I decided to have an Easter egg hunt. And again, I had no clue how many people were going to come. I had no clue what I was doing. I put posters up around the neighborhood in my neighborhood newsletter. I wrote about it and brought these newsletters around. I would make a goal with my kids. I'd say, okay, we're going to deliver 20 newsletters today. And just every day we'd walk and we'd deliver 20 newsletters together. And then on the days that they were in school or I didn't have them, I would go and make a goal to deliver like 50 newsletters by myself. And again, I didn't like the idea of door knocking for me personally. I didn't want it to feel salesy. I just said, hey, I'm a real estate agent. I would love to meet my neighbors. I feel like we don't have any community events. I'd love to invite you to my event. So I, I wanted something of value to give to these people that I was meeting. Got so then I, said, I made it a point to go to every open house in my neighborhood as well. So that I was familiar with floor plans in my neighborhood. I was familiar with what was on the market. I was familiar with pricing and just again, doing everything I could to become the neighborhood expert. And so I'll never forget my first listing came from my newsletter. And it so came how soon, how soon after? So look, you've got $300, you're spending it on Zillow and on newsletters. How soon after? First listing from it took me four months. That's not bad. No. So that means they probably contacted you like month three and then. Um, no, they listed it? right away. They oh. Listed right away. And so what's funny, so I did, let me back up. I did my first community event. I did an Easter egg hunt and I thought it was this like monumental thing. I stuffed 500 Easter eggs by myself and it was a pretty big money commitment. But again, I invited everyone to this Easter egg hunt. I had so many people come. I was wait, like, wait, wait. Well, How, what month is this? So you're, you're like month two, like month one, like my first newsletter talked about come to our Easter egg hunt that's in a couple weeks. So what did your newsletter say on it? Tell me. It what, just what, did Hi, I want to introduce myself. You know, I love the community that we live in and I, you know, want to be more involved. I feel like my kids miss out on participating in community events because it's a two-edged sword. We don't pay an HOA fee, but because of that, we don't have any community events. So I thought, you know what? Why not me? I'll start holding them. And I feel like we as neighbors don't get to know each other because we pull on our garages and we shut our garage door and that's it. We don't even know the people who live next door to us. That's right. You know, this is an opportunity for me to meet more people and get other people in our neighborhood out meeting each other. Why not? Totally worth it to me. And so that's what it said. So come to our first community event. I had put a recipe on it. I put recently sold properties in the neighborhood in it and what they sold for because everyone's wondering what did the neighbor's house sell for? Everyone wants to know that. And um, I'll never forget. I um, actually got an ethics violation because I didn't put my BRE number <laughs> on my first flyer. So I knew, so I had a really great broker at the time. I knew he goes, you're intimidating someone because he said, you've got a target on your back. He said, someone is intimidated by what you're doing. So he goes, 
you know, he, he even told me, he goes, I'll pay the fine for you. Cause he goes, I think it's awesome what you're doing. Ooh, like, wow. Because he, he believed in me and I'm going to get into that in a second too. So anyway, so I had this first Easter egg hunt after my posters, I stuck up on the mailbox banks, like, cause in our neighborhood, you know, they have like the, you know, 12 mailboxes per spot. So I, I printed up big posters, stuck those on and walked run with my kids and invited people to come to our Easter egg hunt. And people came. And so then I just kept up with my neighborhood newsletters. And um, I got, so my first two deals that closed on the same day, one was a Zillow lead and one was a referral from a lender that I'd met at an open house. And I walked in and I said, you know, hi, I'm a new agent. I'm just, you know, getting to know the area, la la la. And he, he told me, he said, my first impression of you was like, great. Who's this blonde? Yet another agent. We're so oversaturated with agents in this neighborhood. But he said after I talked with him, he could tell that I truly was genuine and wanted to get to know the neighborhood well. So he sent me a deal and I closed it. And it was actually a pretty tough client too. So he goes, I was kind of testing you out to see how you could handle it. He goes, and you handled it really well. Mm. So the moral of the story in that is one, don't be a secret agent because you never know who you're having a conversation with that you might impress that even if they aren't in the market, they might know somebody who is. That's a really and good point. The like important that. part is staying top of mind. So by not being a secret agent, you, you got one of your what first two transactions. So that's beautiful. Yeah. You wear a name badge. I just want to know. Nope. Not nope. Some people wear name badges. I don't. I, but. Again, I had so little money. I was like, I don't even want to spend the $30 to order a name badge. I just walked around. I was with my kids most of the time. Yeah. I and love that. so, it, I mean, that's just who I am. Like, my kids have been part of my business. And so then I decided, so I, I started doing more and more business. I, I had, gosh, probably three or four transactions that summer from Zillow Leads. And I started holding open houses for other people because I realized I loved chatting with people. Usually people who came into an open house came for a reason, whether they were just looking or they were a neighbor or they were actually really interested in purchasing. I realized I really loved having these conversations with people about real estate. And so I went to my broker and got advice. Like, what do I do? And he gave me a couple pieces of advice. He said, be hyper local. He said, so many people make the mistake of marketing to an entire county. He said, it's better to get in front of the same person 10 times than to get in front of a hundred people one time. And so he said, you know, keep that in mind. And so that's why like my Zillow marketing, I did one zip code, which was my zip code because I felt like I could be the area expert there. And with my farming, I chose my neighborhood. How big was that? How many homes? Well, my neighborhood's pretty big. It's 1,350 homes. Wow, that's kind of big. You can just take a section of it. Yeah. And so one of the things that I am forever thankful for is that I built a fabulous relationship with my title rep, and he really guided me. And I'm kind of jumping around here, but one of the biggest things that I feel like has been life-changing for me is who I've surrounded myself with. Um, one of my very favorite books, and if you've ever read My Mindset Monday, you've seen me type about a million times as Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he talks about is about how careful you need to be with the people that you surround yourself with. And I had these people who believed in me. I had this lender that I partnered up with. I had my title rep who believed in me and they encouraged me and they saw the potential in me that I honestly didn't even know was there or didn't realize that my tenacity was different than other people. They saw the difference in me versus other people. And so between holding open houses for other people, just getting out and meeting people, my online leads, I started producing a lot and I produced quite a bit. And so in my first, um, my fir I think by July, so I closed my first deals on May 5th and by the middle to end of July, I had already made master's club for my county, which is three and a half million in production. 
Wow. And by, by when? When was that? You started, let's say, it took me two and a half months. Summer? Wow. That's really good. So you brought up a really good point. And I don't think age, some agents that are newer don't, don't really do this. And that's, they, they don't connect with other great agents that can really help them get to where they want to get to quicker. Sometimes they get stuck and they don't, just don't, they don't progress. So I think you brought up a really, really good point. Cause when I first met you, which was about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Yeah, it's a year and a half ago. Geez, I feel like I've known you for. I know it feels like it's been years. forever, right? Uh, you have that effect on people. So, <laughs> uh, I think when I first met you, you you really you could see Nick and I could see that you were just going up to to these agents that other agents don't go up to normally and asking for advice, asking for help, or asking to connect at a later time. And I told Nick, I go, Nick, dude. I mean, we do that, but. You know, people know us, so it's a little different. But for a newer agent to do that, that's pretty awesome. I think you know, that, that, if other people can learn that from you, is very key. I mean, can you talk about that? Because I think that has a lot to do with it. It does. It really does. Because for me, I knew I wanted to be different than just the average agent. Because what is it? The average agent does like three deals a year. That wasn't going to feed my family. I wanted to do more than that. And I knew I was capable of doing more than that. And so I made it a point again about who I surrounded myself with to talk to people who were heavy hitters in the industry and just ask them, what have you done? And I love to read. I absolutely love to read. And I love audiobooks too, because hi, we're realtors. We spend our lives in the car. So I listen to books a lot too. And I read in a book, I want to say it was in the 12 week year by, I think it's by Brian Moran, that he talked about the difference between people who are successful and people who are unsuccessful mm -hmm. is not knowledge. The difference between people who are successful and unsuccessful is implementation. So are you going to take that knowledge and actually apply it? And again, my first broker, he's so awesome that I worked with, said, you know, told me one day, he said, you're really coachable. And he said, most people are not. And I think that that's another important thing too, is when someone gives you advice, as long as it feels in your gut, like that's good advice, take it. Don't take something personally that it's a criticism. If someone, especially a high producing agent is giving you advice that will help you, then be thankful that they've given that to you. And so I just was like a sponge. I just soaked up everything I could from everyone around me and implemented it. I mean, how many times have I asked you for your opinion on stuff? No, <laughs> a lot, but it's good. We put it all in play and we're doing awesome. And so, so my first, so that was May. So my first calendar year in the business, I did 9 million from May to December. That's really good. That's not even a full year. Yeah. <laughs> it so, was crazy. Hold on. Just to help out people, for that first half a year that you were in business, mm -hmm. you've got business from Zillow, from online leads. Yep. You got business from door knocking the newsletters or dropping them off, right? Yep. Having the events, which is kind of part of it. Yep. And where else did you get business from that first year? So a lender that I teamed up with who could see again in me because I feel like lenders are a dime a dozen. I have lenders that are after my business all the time and I'm very, very loyal. And this lender could see that there was a difference in me and just my tenacity and my hunger and my why, why was I pushing so hard for this that he gave me a referral and um, open houses. And so for example, this is when I really, caught the bug. So I got this first listing. It was in my neighborhood. It was from someone that their son had gone to El gone to kindergarten with my son. So they'd seen That's my neighborhood cool. newsletter and they called me and said, Hey, we don't know if you remember us, but we would like to talk to you about selling our house. Okay. Nice. Keep in mind, everyone that's listening, 85% of people will work with the first agent they meet with. 
you will get the time that, and I don't know where I sourced that quote from, but I've read it and I tell it to my team all the time. Um, you will get the times that people interview multiple people for the, you know, for a listing, things like that. But generally speaking, people don't have time and they don't want to put the time into it. No. If they like you and trust you, they're going to work with you. That's and all it comes so down to. Yeah. I was just really honest with them when I met with them, got the listing. So I'm standing at their listing and again, I've made myself the neighborhood expert. I know what properties are selling for in their neighborhood. I know, you know, how all of it goes. So I'm standing holding their listing open, my first listing. Yay, I'm so excited. <laughs> and a lady came in and I'm chatting with her and she's looking at the house. They had a gorgeous pool in their backyard. Gorgeous pool. And it was on a court. So those two things combined. Beautiful. Yes. And this lady came in and she's checking it out. And so I just you know, start talking with her. This is my key line at open houses. Tell me a little bit about what you're looking for. And so then it gets people talking. And then another, I never have people sign in at an open house. Big, like this is my open house thing. I never have people sign in. So no, no open home pro, no. I have open home sign pro. In. No, I mean, but you don't use it though. <laughs> I use it. Oh, as you're walking with them. So you do what I do. I Got never, it. ever ask people for their information ever until I've had a conversation with them, one. Yeah. And two, I only give them, ask them for their information if it's because I have found a reason to send them something. Got it. Oh, nice. I like that. And so I ask them, tell me a little bit about what you're looking for. Well, usually if I'm at an open house in my neighborhood, they're probably interested in living in my neighborhood. Yeah. Or something yeah. brought them there. Because to exactly. go into an open house, it's exactly. got to have some type of interest or commitment. Yeah. Totally. So this lady came in. And again, this is where I'm honing my open house skills. I'd held open houses for other people. But this lady came in and she tells me, well, we actually live here in the neighborhood and we're interested in selling our house um, and buying something bigger. And I said, oh, well, you know, my first agent. So have you met with anybody about selling your house? Yeah, we have an agent already. I said, okay, great. I said, so tell me, you know, what price range are you wanting to be in? And because I'm thinking, sure, you know, if I cooperate with another agent to sell this listing, great, why not? And she said, well, we're not really quite sure, you know, and she's talking to me. I said, well, tell me how much you guys going to be selling your house for? And she said, two seventy nine. And my jaw hit the floor. And I said, <laughs> have you signed anything with that agent? And she goes, no, we just met with him one time. And I said, I'm really careful. I don't like to step on people's toes, but I can tell you, I know our neighborhood inside and out. And she goes, yeah, I've seen your neighborhood newsletters before. I'm like, oh, nice. Look at that. It's already going around. You're selling your house for too little. That's not enough money. I said, your house should sell for 300,000. I said, I know your floor plan. The one around the corner from you sold for two ninety five. dollars What you're telling me with the upgrades that you've done and the upward progression in trends and pricing in our neighborhood, yours really should go for more than $300,000. I would love after this open house to come and chat with you and your husband. I said, again, I don't want to step on any toes, but I just want to make sure you're not leaving any money on the table. And she's like, I would love it. What time can you come? I love that. I love how you handled that. And so I set the appointment for her for an hour after my open house was over, ran home, made a CMA <laughs> for printed the listing agreement, met with them, and they were like, yeah, if you're going to get us 20000 we're like, how confident are you? And I said, look, I'm not going to overpromise something, but I said, I can tell you this one, this one, this one, all model matches like yours sold closer to 300000 I feel pretty comfortable because their house was Absolutely, darling. I said, I feel pretty comfortable. We can get 300000 for your house. So when, when they're coming into the open house, you're probably just like me, like outside, you're calm, you're easy. And inside, you're like, oh, yeah, baby, let's do this. Yeah, I know. I'm like, yes, <laughs> listing appointment right off this. I'm like, this is working. So this is what caught the bug for me. So boom, right then and there, they were like, yeah, let's sign the listing agreement. Sweet. Nice. Okay, like I didn't even push them. They said, but here's the problem. We're leaving for Hawaii in five days. I said, I can get your house listed before that. That's the perfect time for me to sell your house. They're like, really? Are you? <laughs> he said, honestly, it's going to be the easiest for us to schedule showings for, you know, while you're gone. Because you're, you're out. In doggy daycare. Let's do, so, do this. And they're like, okay. 
boom, got their house sold while they were gone. And it just was the snowball effect, just more and more and more and more. And so about a month later, I was holding a luxury listing open for a different agent in my office. And I, again, you know, was new to the luxury market. I, I fortunately have experience around luxury real estate, but I didn't have an experience selling it. So I felt comfortable in it. Okay. But a guy came in and he seemed very interested in the house. So I'm chatting with him, just, you know, being very friendly, trying to get a feel. And he's like, okay, I'll be back. And um, you know, I have somebody I have to go pick up at the airport and then I'll be back. Okay. So not thinking much about it. You know, he drove a nice Mercedes. I, you know, anyways, off that open house, I, there was a house at the end of the street that was listed for sale as well. And it was probably $600,000 more. It was on a lot bigger of a lot. The one I was holding up in was five acres. That one was 10 acres, had a private lake. And so I said, well, and they're like, well, can you get us into that one? We don't have an agent we're working with. Why, yes, I can. <laughs> and so I make an appointment directly with the seller, which is what the agent did. And can I just say, everyone, please don't ever put your seller's information in the MLS. Yes, there are sources like Cole Realty Resource and stuff like that to get their information. It's a really bad idea to have other agents interacting with your sellers. Oh, yeah. Really bad idea. I cannot tell you how many times I've had sellers come to me, me not stepping on any toes, that they've canceled their listing and they enjoyed interacting with me just from me scheduling the appointment for my buyers to come see their house. And it didn't work out for whatever reason, but I would always, you know, let the sellers know, I'm sorry, they're interested, you know, that kind of thing, just being really open that sellers have canceled their listing agreements and come to me to list their house. Wow. So I go take these people to go see this house at the end of the street. Mm -hmm. And it's the same guy that had come through my open house. Oh, whoa. Is the seller. Is the seller. So I totally played off. Like I have no clue who he is. He's telling me all about the house. <laughs> and, and there's a lot to it. It's totally off the grid. It has tons of solar, the, you know, movie theater, the private lake, you know, everything. So my clients come. They're not interested in it. I had some other clients that I also got off that open house. It was a busy open house that wanted to see it. And I couldn't get a hold of the seller to schedule another showing. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. And of course... I'm not going to let this go to waste. I've got some luxury buyers that want to see this. I think it was listed at 1.4 million. And I, I mean, to the point where I saved the seller's number in my cell phone because I'm like trying to get an appointment with him to let me show his house again. Wow. So about six weeks later, I'm walking through Costco again, children in tow. And the seller calls me and I'm thinking, dude, you are so too late. If you had any interest in selling, <laughs> these buyers have like long been done with the idea of your house. So I answer the phone and says, hi, it's Dave. I don't know if you remember me. Um, you know, you were trying to show, you showed my house one time. You're trying to show my house. And I said, yes. I said, unfortunately, those buyers have moved on. He goes, well, that's actually not why I'm calling you. And I said, Okay. He said, I canceled my listing with my previous agent and I wanted to know if you'd come list my house for me. Wow. Just like that. Um, sure. Let and me I, think about it. I know. Right. And I had done research on him. I knew that he was a custom home builder. Wow. And so I just said, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go out on a limb. I said, I would be happy to come list your house. I said, here's the thing though. You either need to make some changes to your house or you need to reduce the price because that's why it hasn't sold. Because it's a $1.4 million house with laminate flooring in it. I was like, well, who yeah, does? In your neighbor, that's not going to fly there. No, no. And so, again, I was just super straightforward with him and just said, look, you know, I want your house to sell. And this is why I feel like it hasn't sold. So, again, just very straightforward, very candid with him, very nice. And... I got his house sold in like two weeks and it had been on the market for six months before. Wow. And the moral of the story in all of this is one, you never know who you're interacting with. So have that energy level, that excitement, that tenacity and charm for lack of a better term, yeah. no matter who you're talking to. 
You never know when someone's got a rich aunt or uncle. You never know when someone, I mean, I've seen some of the wealthiest people look like the humblest people driving a beat up old truck or, you know, something like that because it's their truck from high school that they love. Yeah. So I, I just really want to reinforce people that you never know who you're going to come across and to always have that upbeat, high energy attitude. When I closed that sale for that seller, he said, Amanda, I've built over 200 custom homes in this area. Wow. That's a lot. I know every real estate agent in this area. And he said, I researched you. I knew you were brand new. He said that didn't bother me because I could tell that you had the energy level and the motivation to sell my house. I love that. That's a perfect comment for, for, for all agents, no matter if they're newer, older, um, just in the middle. It's just that that's the key. It's, it's the energy it's got, you've got to, connect you've got to make the other person feel like you're going to get the job done i think yes. and that's, and that's that really they're cool. more than just a job to you and so you know going back starting to how i got here goals are super important to me um i read the miracle morning very early on in my career and so your career of real estate or yeah, of real okay. estate of real estate because innately i'm a night owl i can stay up till two three o'clock in the morning no issue getting up <laughs> early gouge my eyes out and so i said you know what i'm gonna give it a go i thought hell elrod's story was incredible and i just said i'm gonna give this a go and so i wrote down my goals i wrote down what i wanted my life to look like and if there's any piece of advice that i could give to anyone excuse me, regardless of what stage in their career they're at, figure out what you want your life to look like. Because um, again, going back to, to Napoleon Hill, he says, a man without a plan is like a ship without a course. So if you don't know what you want, what you want your life to look like, what are you doing? Like, there's no point. Yeah. There's no point because yeah. you're just wandering aimlessly. That's and a so really good point. Down and write down what, and I do this with my team too. I, there's five areas and I got this um, from Hal Elrond. There's five areas, spiritual, physical, professional, financial, and um, personal. So your personal relationships, what do you want your finances to look like? What kind of production do you want to have? Um, what do you want your physical goals to be? And what do you want your spiritual goals to be? So can you repeat those for people? Yep. So spiritual, physical, financial, professional, and personal. I'm typing it up for everyone. Perfect. And go through and rate yourself in all five of those areas. Where are you at on a one to 10? Because the point is that you want to be at a level 10 in all of those areas. And it's possible. And so then go back through and once you rate yourself, go back through and figure out what would your level 10 life look like in each of those areas. If you'd gone to a level 10 life in each of those five areas, what would it look like? Oh, that's a good question. And so then once you write that down, then go back and figure out what are two things you can do each day to move towards that level 10 life in each of those areas? Just two things. So then I took it, I take it a step further and I learned this in a, a class that I took one time about taking all five of those areas and writing it out in one paragraph of what, if someone took a snapshot of you living your level 10 life mm -hmm. in those areas, what would it look like? Who would you be with? Where would you be? What would you be doing? What would it look like? Taste like, smell like, like all of it. Like, what would you be doing? Paint a picture of if somebody had snapped a picture of you living this level 10 life. What would it look like? So do you think this process then took you to, to wanting to go for a team and then growing from there or, or what, 
What made yeah. you want to have a team? I mean, because you kept on growing so fast. Yeah, I have grown really fast. So what made me want to have a team was I realized that my story was atypical. I realized that there's not, to my knowledge, ever been a single mom in real estate that's just come out of the gates like I have producing really, really well. And because my first, that first half year, I did 9 million. My second calendar year, like my first full calendar year in the business, I did 15 million. And wow. then my next calendar year, I did 50 million. Whoa, so I that's 49, insane. I did 49, nine, nine, I could think we're like $5,000. You shy. destroyed the other years. <laughs> yeah, I did. And so year over year, I want my growth to continue being that big. But the reason why was I realized that my story was atypical and that if I could help other people have a growth trajectory similar to mine, even if it didn't have to be the same, because honestly, it's taken a lot of sleepless nights to get to where I'm at. And a lot of people don't care about having that level, but even if they care about being 80% of where I've gotten to, even if I could make a difference in helping them get to 80% of where I've gotten to, even that is life altering for people. Yeah, I agree. And or even I, 50%. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I love the quote that says, your 80% could be somebody else's 127%. <laughs> and so, again, I realize That's I'm really over the top kind of in everything that I do because now I've taken up Ironman triathlons too. Mm -hmm. and, um, but again, the old saying of where you show up one place in life is where you'll show up everywhere. So I've realized that if I push myself to the max in one area in life, I can push myself to the max in every area of life. So a week from tomorrow, I have a full Ironman and it's going to take me about 14 or 15 hours to complete. <laughs> That's insane. But for me, if I know I can push myself to that max, why not? You know, we interviewed um, Joe Stump yesterday, and it was the uh -huh. same thing. He's like, yeah, I'm doing this. He's 60 years old. The guy's cut up like Arnold Schwarzenegger was when he was young. I'm like, dude, and he's going to go do uh, an Ironman. I was like, that's insane. This is super cool, but it pushes you. It pushes you to, yeah. to another level. It does, and it teaches you that when you set that goal, that crazy huge goal, that you can achieve it because I just went and did race distance because part of me was like, I don't know if I can really do this. So a few weeks ago, I went and did full race distance to make so, sure I could. Amanda, question. Um, a, a lot of people hear all the good things in, because you know you and I are pretty positive and, and most of our admins are as well. And that's why we say a lot of positive things and we tell everybody our successes, but we don't really tell people our obstacles, right? Oh my god. Because I don't like to focus on those, but tell me, you know, I know you've had a lot of adversity and oh a crap load of obstacles. <laughs> but you don't we don't share those out there, but can you can you tell us Sometimes I like to share them. Because yeah. I'm able to realize I'm real. Like this hasn't just been handed to me. This isn't like life is all just rainbows and unicorns. I mean, it's freaking hard. So some of my obstacles, one, I'm a single mom. There, it's me. And so it's me at doctor's appointments, at swim meets, at, you know, my kids, I, all three of my kids are competitive swimmers. So that's six days a week. You know, those obstacles of figuring out how to juggle that work family life and still be the mom that I want to be. Because the progression in my career was it was survival. And then it was, hey, I'm I'm really enjoying this to okay, I really like have caught the bug. I'm really hungry for this to okay, I want to be massive in my production. And so there's so many obstacles. I've lost people on my team, and it wasn't always a pretty separation. There's times where my kids have come to me and say, mom, we feel like you're working all the time. You know, again, I level with them and say, I'm a single mom and you've never stepped foot in a daycare and we live a pretty awesome life. So it's been bringing my kids to the reality 
because I'll be the first person to say I think kids are pretty entitled <laughs> this day and age. And so it's teaching my kids that life doesn't get to be just unicorns and fairies all the time. And it's happy go lucky. We have to work hard. There's sacrifices we have to make. And so to balance that, one thing that is super important to me and my kids know this is I do mom and me time with my kids every day. I spend 10 minutes one-on-one -on -one with each of my kids every day. They get to choose what we do and that's our time. That's our time to connect. And it may be like, oh, 10 minutes isn't that long, but it's pretty tough to carve 30 minutes out where I don't have my phone, where I'm not, you know, like it's one-on-one -on -one with them. You know, that's besides, so people understand that's also besides you being with them and them being around you. It's not like you're just, hey, right. here's 10 minutes, guys, right? No, it's not like that. Yeah, exactly. And that's with each of my kids, though, one-on-one. Yeah. -on -one. And so, and that's what I reinforce my kids all the time is, look, my job is awesome because... I might be negotiating three deals right now, but I'm snuggled up to you on the couch while I'm doing it. There's not a lot of jobs that afford that opportunity. I and agree. So, yeah, I mean, a big part of the obstacles that I faced are, I mean, disappointments and transactions. Oh my gosh. I take it so personally when I have a client who's disappointed in me or when I've lost a listing to someone else or when a property hasn't sold and they cancel their listing because they're, you know, frustrated with me. Yes, there's extenuating circumstances, but when I know, when I've set these goals and I know that I'm reviewing them daily to push myself to being the best I can be, there I know that I can sleep at night knowing that I've done my best. And so I was telling you this morning, Tristan, my, my new theme song is Whatever It Takes by Imagine Dragons because that truly has been my theme in life. I couldn't tell you what movies are in the movie theater. I couldn't tell you what TV shows are on. I couldn't tell you what's going on in pop culture and celebrity life. And I remember I said something and someone was like, you didn't know that? And I'm like, I live here. <laughs> so it's a matter of your priorities. For me, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to my goals. And now when I say whatever it takes, I'm not going to sacrifice my ethics and I'm not going to sacrifice my relationships with my family. But other than that, I'm going to sacrifice everything else, everything in my power that doesn't depreciate my character to do whatever it takes to getting to my goals. And people need to have that attitude in life. Yeah. I think what happens is when you don't have that mindset and you work a lot on your mindset, we didn't even touch on that, but when you don't have that mindset that I'm going to do whatever it takes, you get stuck on, well, you know, this happened to me. Oh, here's something else that happened to me. And it's always about what happened to you, right? Yeah, uh, so we, you know, mentality. Yeah, Don't be a victim. Yeah. So I think <laughs> the mindset, and, and if, if for the people that know you well, and for the people that get to meet you, they can see that you're a very, very cheerful person, very happy. <laughs> and, and then as you start talking, you're like, wow, this this lady's mindset is pretty strong. It's like, wow, this is this is definitely a different type of woman. And, and that's important because I know you've done the whole uh, Hal Elrond thing, and, and that is part of your life, the whole miracle morning where you start off with, with your process, right? And even at night, you end with a process. I do. But what would you say is the one thing, because we've got 12 minutes, but what would you say is the one thing that shifted you from going to a single, being a single agent, mm -hmm. right? into creating a team and now creating a mega team and really going to that next level that you're getting to, which is even bigger. So yeah. tell us the process of what you think got you there and is getting you to the next level. It is mindset and it's a hundred percent. What you put out is what you're going to attract. I have never once recruited for my team ever. And once we have, uh, we've got a couple people getting their licenses, I'll have 17 agents on my team plus myself. That's insane. And again, it's the importance of who you surround yourself with and the importance of having that mindset and having that energy that we're in this together. We're here to build each other up and support each other. And we're going to celebrate each other's successes. And to me, that is what has been the difference coupled with, 
how it's important to me to run my team. I feel like there's a lot of team leaders who have kind of the pyramid approach where they're on top and the agents under them are their little minions. Mm -hmm. I never, ever, ever want the agents on my team to feel like my minions. Yeah. I want it to be quite the opposite. I want it to be like an upside down pyramid approach where I'm on the bottom and I'm there to support them and mentor them and lift them up and be their sounding board or help them, you know, help talk them through something difficult in a transaction or something like that, because that's what I'm here for. Well, I think it all, that also starts with the, with the language that you use in regards to how they're part of your team. I hear a lot of people saying that, oh, they're just, they're just a team member, you know, and just a buyer's agent. Just a buyer's agent. Where if you just change that, exactly, just change it to something where they can have some pride in themselves when they say it. Oh, you know what? Amanda is my business partner. Right? Oh, you talk to my business partner, Amanda, and I think that has a lot to do with with what you start building. That whole culture starts growing. It's like, wow, you know what? I'm just I'm not just another person on the team. Yeah. I'm someone that matters to Amanda, right? And look, you're going to lose people. We all lose people. I have. I have lost people. Yeah. And it hurts. It's painful. You feel like, I mean, some of them I feel like stabbed me in the back in really just brutal and ugly ways. But again, I chose to not focus on that. I chose to focus on upward and onward. My goals and how getting negative energy off our team getting the negative people off the bus. If you've read the energy bus, love that book, the energy vampires. I, what? Vampires. I have to write that down. Hold on. Oh, the energy bus. Oh my gosh. It's a short little read. It's the best. Oh, okay. Energy highly recommend it. And I could give everybody my reading list. I've read some really awesome books that I could highly recommend. The energy bus one. by John Gordon. Yes. Yes, and it's a story. Super easy read. Super, super easy read. But get the energy vampires off your bus. <laughs> That's so funny. Let me put that in here. And so another book that I'm almost finished with, it's taken me a little while to get through because I haven't had as much time on my Miracle Mornings lately as I've been doing my triathlon training to do to read as much as I want to, but I'm reading a book called Grit. And I feel oh, like that's a good book. embodies my life. Of it talks about how success is not just passion. The success is passion plus perseverance. So you've got to love what you do and you've got to keep going and do whatever it takes to accomplish it. Because even if you love what you do, there's still going to be hard things. And I think that's the biggest thing that in writing down what my level 10 life looked like and in writing down what steps I needed to take every day to achieve that level 10 life, I figured out the things that I love. I didn't even know what I loved. I didn't even know what hobbies I had. I grew up as a wife and a mom. Literally I was a teenager still. And so I had to figure out who I was. I had to create who I was. I got to create who I was. And I think that's the biggest thing is that writing down what I wanted my life to look like, I was able to mold all those things around it and to figure out what I was passionate about and to run with that. I've realized I'm as passionate about helping other people build their businesses as I am about selling real estate in general. And I think that's another thing that has drawn people to my team is that I have a great value add in how I run my team from the technology to the leads that we provide. We provide so many leads um, to the mentoring, to the one-on-one. -on -one. You know, some of my agents like accountability, some of them don't. And so I love meeting with my ones that love the accountability because then I can say, you know, how are you doing here? What can we do better here? And really help build and coach them. And so if I could reinforce to anyone, it's find what you love. There, if you're in this business, I really hope you love at least some part of it. And so figure out what part of it you love and revolve your business around that because that's what you're going to be consistent about. That's what you're going to persevere through the hard times is to be able to do those pieces you love and just push for that. I'm and writing that down for everyone. That's perfect. Find, find what you love about this business and focus on that. 
focus all your energy. Yes. And that. the transactions will come. So then you'll get to the point where you can leverage out and hire people to do the pieces you don't love. I agree with you. That's, that's perfect. And I think a lot of the times people's energy fizzles out and they're like, well, you know what? I don't like this part of the business. And then they focus on that. And then all of a sudden their energy levels dropped and they're not consistent anymore and doing anything. And now they're struggling. That's faded. And they are, you know, their, their energy, not just their energy level, but their positive versus negative energy. They're, they're an, an energy vampire to be around and nobody wants to be around that. Clients can tell that, um, other agents that you're working with, because the country in general is on a great upward trend right now in real estate. So not just my market and many markets around the country, we are seeing Almost multiple. Everywhere. Yeah. And so what do you need to do? Pick up the phone and become friends with the agent on the other side. I assure you as an agent who carries a lot of listings, I am so much more likely to advise my seller, hey, this has been a really good agent to work with. They've been super communicative. They've been really polite. They've been just, you know, great to chat with. My mom always told me you catch a whole lot more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. I love that, that saying that you always use. I love that one. And I never remember it when I need it. I'm like, Amanda says something about honey and flies, and I don't know. <laughs> You can always text me. You know? I don't know what. I just call you next time. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Anyways, a few people are asking, what can you give us a list of maybe your top five books? I've got The Energy okay. Bus, Miracle okay. Morning. What would I'm you say? My Audible list there? here. So, oh, one of the things that I want to touch on, and I think that people miss this a ton in our business, is the physical health aspect. If you are eating like crap, if you are not working out, if you are not taking care of yourself, you are going to not only have nothing to give to the people around you, but your mental energy will be low. You'll have a foggier brain and you've got to take care of yourself. And let's be real. Appearances are important. If you come as somebody who you can tell takes good care of themselves, you don't have to be an Ironman triathlete, but get up and go for a walk for 15 minutes in the morning. Do seven minutes of strength training workout. There's um, a couple different apps. There's one called seven. It's seven minute workouts. There's one that's called, I think it's 12 minute workouts. I mean, anybody has time for that. Just start somewhere. Your physical energy, your aura about you is that much healthier. Eat healthy. Don't live in a drive through Don't live at Starbucks. And I'm not dinging anybody for, I'm not even going to get into the controversy of whatever that unicorn drink was or whatever that everybody's flipping out about. Oh, yeah. Eat healthy. <laughs> Limit your sugar intake. Limit your processed well, food. Well, Amanda, on that point, I'm going to ask, how do you do that? Because, look, I, I, even, I have challenges when I'm, when I'm out showing property listings or going back and forth traveling. I'm picking up what that Starbucks, right? How, how do you not do that? I meal prep. All right. Prep. And I keep healthy snacks in my fridge. I have a fridge out in my garage. And so what I do on Sundays, I plan out my week and I also meal prep for the week. And so then as I'm running out the door, because I am constantly racing out the door to an appointment, I stop by my garage fridge and I throw food into my lunch bag and I go. I keep pre hard boiled eggs. I buy the peeled organic hard boiled eggs at Costco, string cheese. I meal prep. So I've got high protein meals because that is what is key. That's what's key to anything in life is planning. Stuff that's last minute. And trust me, I am naturally a procrastinator. I work really well under pressure. <laughs> yes, you do. I know that. That's so <laughs> true. But I can tell you that my secret to being healthy and eating healthy is meal prep. Nice. Plan ahead. Grocery shop. Plan menus. If anybody wants meal options, I can give you a whole list of super fast, easy, really healthy foods. 
that aren't processed, but it makes a difference. It makes a difference in how you feel about yourself and how you feel about yourself makes a difference in the aura that you emanate. When you're putting healthy fuel into your body, you're going to get healthier results out of your body. Amanda, I, I feel like you should write a book. I'm going to. You know what? You should just put this all in a book and just sell it. <laughs> this is some good stuff. So I'm going to give you a couple. Lists yeah, give us, give us two or three more here. So Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Super important. It's a longer book. If you go on YouTube, um, Earl Nightingale summarized Think and Grow Rich. You can find it on YouTube for free. You can find it on Audible. It's 43 minutes long. I listened to it morning and night. I have it on Audible. It costs $3.99 to buy. If you're an Audible member, it's not even worth a credit because it costs $3.99 to buy. I listen to it on 2x speed. It takes me 20 minutes to get through it, morning and night. Perfect. And so Think and Grow Rich, um, Grit is absolutely fantastic. Grit is good. And I got to say that too. Um, let's see. What's another one? Better Than Before. It's all about habits and mastering habits because we're all different and we all want to get in good habits, but this teaches you kind of what type of a person you are and how you will do better at sticking with the habits that you want to set. All right. I love so, that. Let's see another one. Um, oh, 10 X rule. If you haven't read 10 X rule, that's a must read compound years. effect. Also a must read. Oh, compound effect is, I mean, that's on the top of the list. Oh, oh, it totally is. I love Darren Hardy. Yeah. Love, love Darren Hardy. All right. So you've got Ener the energy bus, miracle yes. morning, think and grow rich, grit, better than before 10 X rule and compound effect. I think that's enough for the, for the rest yeah. of the year there. I'm happy to uh, provide uh, my audible list is very, very, very long. That's and a good one, one last thing too, a little tip. And I learned this from my great friend, Ben Kinney. I buy the audiobook and I physically buy the book from Amazon. What I used to do is I'd listen to the audiobook and then if I liked it, then I'd go buy the book so I could mark it up, but it just wasn't happening. So I buy the audiobook, I buy the physical book. And I sit there with the book in my hands and I set Audible on like 2x speed and I've got a pen and I sit and read through the book while Audible's reading it to me. And even if you only spend 10 minutes a day to do that, do that. You get through books so quickly that way. And you, depending on if you're an auditory or a visual learner, you've got both senses going there. And it keeps me, because I'm like great at tuning out an audio book because I've got three kids and I can tune out the noise. <laughs> That's so true. I can tune out an audio book. So if I'm reading it in front of me and listening to it, I absorb the information that much more. I agree. All right. Any last closing words here? Choose what you want to be. Don't let anyone else choose it for you. Ooh. Choose what you want your life to look like. Choose what goals you want to accomplish. Napoleon Hill says that whatever the mind can conceive and believe, you can achieve. You don't let anyone else, because trust me, I cannot tell you how many times people said to me, you will not be successful in real estate as a single mom. It's just too demanding. My That's kids so have never sad. stepped foot in a daycare. And there are months that we've done over 30 transactions in a month. So you can do it. Don't let someone else tell you what your life is going to look like. You choose what your life is going to look like and you run with it. I think now more than ever, um, we can make the impossible possible in the life that we live in right now. So. All right. Well, thank it. you. I appreciate you have it. that dream, run after it. Never give up on a dream because of the time that it was going to take to accomplish. The time is going to pass anyways. So just go for it. All right. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks for your time. Thanks, for me, Thanks everybody.